You know, tonight, I want to talk to us for a little while, and then we'll probably pick this up at another time, about murmuring and complaining. Now, I don't preach this, I don't teach this as an indictment against anyone tonight. Sometimes I just think there's things that are important to God that we need to be reminded of, even if we already know, and we need to be aware of it. And we need to look in our lives at the back several months or year, and we need to say, okay, if this has been happening some in my life, I need to shave off the extra things that don't need to be on there, lay aside the weight, and continue to do better from here forward. But this is something that pleases God. Amen. When we understand that God actually literally hates murmuring. Yes, he, he hates complaining. Does everybody here want to be pleasing to the Lord? You want the Lord to bless you and you want favor in your life? I know we all want that. So even the little things sometimes, murmuring. It didn't even say all out griping. <laughs> Just murmuring. Here's the thing. You work hard. You do the best you can with yourself. If you can influence your spouse, great. If you can influence your kids, well, I hope we can. Um, but people around us, we are not responsible for what they do, and we are not responsible for what they say. But we can always not be a party to it. Right. We don't have to join in with it. Amen. We don't have to encourage them. Amen. We don't even have to agree with them. I'm not going to agree, agree with murmuring and complaining that's contrary to God and his will. That's right. I'm not going yeah. to do it. I'm not going to do it. Because usually in a relationship with God and even in a church, God takes us into a time of testing before he brings us into a time of power. You look all through the Bible, you'll see that it happened that way. When people were getting ready to go into another dimension, when the church was getting ready to go into another dimension, there was always a time of testing. Yes. It might be 40 days. It might be 40 years. It might not be 40. But it seemed like 40 days or 40 years is attached to that time of testing. When the people of Israel, like in Numbers 11, my text, which I was reading what it referred to, that's similar to what Israelites went through in the wilderness as they moved from Egypt to the promised land. And as we go through a time of testing, and I believe we are in the time of testing in this church. I really do. I believe that. Um... But we've been in it for a little while, and I believe we're about to come out of it. Amen. 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 I said, I believe we're about to come out of Amen. it. Amen. Can I get anybody that has faith in this room tonight to talk back to me a little bit? Come on, wake up. <laughs> and um, even if you don't, if you don't hadn't fully grasped that, if you say amen to it, that's saying let it be, let it be, let it happen, let it take place. I'm in agreement with what God's will is and what he wants to do. So we need to understand what it takes to pass and make it through this testing into God's promise, into the power, because you're not going to be able to take a detour and go around it. It doesn't matter how bad you want to stop and go around it. You're not going around it. I know uh, there was one time that when they were in the wilderness, the Bible said the people were discouraged because of the way. They got discouraged because of the path, because of the journey. 
They were getting discouraged. That happens. Sometimes it's hard. Sometimes it's rough. Sometimes we go through areas of testing and we go through just life and we go through hardships. You know, it may be with all of a sudden you find out you, you got some condition physically in your body or someone that you love dearly has got some kind of condition. Or, um, you know, you lose some money, lose two or three hundred dollars, you know, rolled up in a something and you don't know where you put it and, and you think it's lost. Or it's worse than that. Maybe, maybe you get a, a four or five thousand dollar doctor's bill that you weren't expecting and don't know how you're going to pay it. And, and so having to pay that puts your, all your finances in, in a, an awry. It puts them in, in stress. Or maybe it's just something at work. Or maybe it's someone you know. Or maybe it's just your attitude about life. And, and you don't know why. You're just disgusted and disgruntled. And you're not happy. Well, I've got news for you today. Sometimes God's hand is in that. And sometimes God's doing it because he wants us to be tested. Now, in 1 Corinthians 10, 6 that I read, it said it happened as examples for us that God's anger was kindled and the fire of the Lord burned among them, that we should not try the Lord as some of them did. And another place, and I'll probably read it before we get done, it said, don't harden your hearts and provoke God. And he called he called their murmuring an evil heart of unbelief. Because if you understand the battle, and every time you rise up, or every time you want to do something for God, there's a warfare. There's a warfare involved. I was talking to Brother Stephen about this just the other night. And, and, and a lot of us get into to warfare when we face needs. You know, we, we battle for a breakthrough in our finances or we battle uh, warfare for a new job or for revival as a church and for deliverance of someone or ourselves in areas or for physical healing and for the salvation of loved ones. But if we think that the battle is for these things, we do not understand the battle. We do not understand warfare. This is a very, very important point for us to remember because in reality, we're not in battle over the things. Amen. We are in battle for one thing, and that is faith. The warfare, the real battle, is about our faith. The Bible says faith is the one thing that is so essential that without it, it is impossible to please God. Amen. And in another place, it said, if you, that which is not of faith is sin. That's literally hard. That's harsh words, and especially in our postmodern world today where, you know, we've got to consider and agree and everything else. But faith, if we have faith, somebody say, if I have faith then nothing is impossible and nothing is withheld. She already read the verse that said that, uh, that those that fear the Lord, reverence, respect, or worship the Lord have, do not want for anything. You know what the word want right there means? It means need or the thing needed. And it means poverty. Need or thing needed or poverty. Now that's a promise. Amen. If you worship the Lord, you will not be in want. Amen. In other words, you won't have a need and God not supply it. Amen. You won't have a need and God not supply it. So stop worrying about the needs. Walk in faith. Sure, we got to carry the needs to the Lord. We got to tell the Lord about the needs. 
But that's all. Don't get boggled down in the enormity of the needs because the battle is for your faith. So the Bible says when you have faith, nothing is impossible. And no matter what we need, if you can get in faith and stay in faith, every need will be supplied. Uh, Paul said, but... But my God shall supply all of your needs according to what? His riches in glory. Not according to your bank account. Not according to your job. Not according to your IQ or your skills or your talents or your abilities. According to his riches in glory. But sometimes and most of the time, staying in faith requires a battle. It does. It requires a battle. And two of Satan's most powerful weapons against you is fear and doubt. Fear and doubt. I was talking to these guys, uh, Brother Rex, earlier about my wife picking up someone for her class Tuesday, the Seeds of Hope class. That is a class for domestic abused women and she has a wonderful ministry there she's a survivor of domestic abuse and and uh, got a testimony and already been several people helped and encouraged and strengthened and, and healed already connected to her ministry but she was dropping this young lady off or picking her up picking her up uh, for that class yesterday evening. And uh, as she went by a certain intersection that was close to the area there in downtown Wichita, uh, there was protesters on the sides of the road. And when she pulled up, she saw that they were protest protesting value them both. And... Um, she said that uh, when she pulled up to that intersection and they saw her bumper sticker that says vote yes on value them both because that's the pro-life vote is yes. She said they started snarling and yelling and screaming and getting so agitated and cursing her and hollered and carried on. And then she said there was another car over here in this lane that started blowing their horn, was encouraging them, keep on, keep on. Well, let the devil roll his eyes and get mad. I don't care if he gets mad. I, I, I Actually, it, it tickles my, it tickles me pink that he's mad, actually. I'm so happy that the devil's mad. That means we got him stirred up. We got him stressed. He's worried. He's under pressure. He's afraid he might lose. And in the power and the authority of the name of Jesus Christ, he is going to lose. And that spirit of death is going to fall from over this town and this city in the name of Jesus. But fear, she was afraid a little bit at first. She said it got sketchy. <laughs> She didn't know if they was going to attack her or what. I said, yeah, that spirit is stirred up and is trying to intimidate because it's concerned about what's happening. That means God is putting the pressure on the spirit. And remember, we're not wrestling against people. It's not humans. God bless them. If they want to let the enemy use them, that's between them and the Lord. But we're not going to fight humans. We're going to pray against the spirit. And the principalities and the powers. And you know what? God's going to look at that. And he's going to bless us. And he's going to give us victory. Because we're doing it God's way. Fear. Doubt. The devil wants to intimidate you. He tries to come against you. In just your simple life of day to day experiences. Life's moments. And cause you to lose your faith. But there's even a greater danger. To our faith than the attacks of Satan because sometimes Satan does not have to work that hard to destroy our faith because we're so good at destroying our own faith you know how we destroy our own faith 
by murmuring and complaining. Chuck Pierce, prophet, apostle, said this. The greatest snare in the wilderness is murmuring and complaining over your present position before you reach the place God has for you. Because if you start murmuring and complaining about the position that you're in, you will negate the place that God wants you to go. With Israel, the Israelites, from the time they came out of Egypt, they started murmuring and complaining and murmuring and complaining continually. And every situation they come into, every testing they faced, their response was to murmur. It was to complain. And that's ultimately what kept them out of the promised land. It was not God's will to keep them out of the promised land. But they kept speaking negative stuff and complaining. Mm. What is murmuring and complaining? Let Let me explain it like, let me define it like this. Murmuring and complaining is the repeated voicing of our dissatisfaction over the situation God has placed you in. If you don't believe that things just happen randomly, which if you're a child of God, you shouldn't. The Bible says a good man's steps are ordered of the Lord. Then you're in the situation, you're in the place you're in for some reason. Maybe it's just so that you will praise him to get to the next level. Maybe it's so you can just be tested so that God can trust you with another dimension. It may be for that very reason. But when you describe your situation all the time, telling people, here's what's going on in my life. Girl, it's so rough. It's hard. That's you voicing your dissatisfaction with the place you are in. Sometimes this this murmuring and complaining comes from self-pity. I'm not going to go over this a lot tonight. But even when you describe and tell people about it so they feel sorry for you, that don't help the situation. The situation is still there. It's still the same. Sometimes complaining comes from anger. Sometimes it comes from bitterness. You pray. You're still having the same problem, so you get angry with God. You want to tell other people about how angry you are, about where you are, so you repeatedly voice the problem. But let me tell you something. Whether it comes from self-pity or it comes from a desire for sympathy or it comes from a heart of bitterness that's produced by anger, murmuring and complaining always comes from a heart of unbelief. It always comes from a heart of unbelief. Listen to me, ladies and gentlemen, and when I tell you this, hear me and hear me well. Faith does not complain. Faith does not complain. Love don't judge. And faith does not complain. There is no complaint that rises from the heart of faith. When I shake hands with people and they say, how you been doing? I either say one or two things, but I almost always say one or two things. I am blessed or I'm doing good or I can't complain. Or I won't complain. I won't complain because faith sees a a remedy. Faith sees an alternative. Faith sees a way out. And you stand back and watch God honor that in your life. You just start believing God through. It don't matter if it's just, if it's not for you, if it's for your family or someone, um, someone else. 
But when you are complaining, you can believe that faith is no longer present. I've already taught you as, as a congregation since I've been here that faith is the currency of the supernatural. Faith is the currency of the spiritual, of heaven. You, you want to know how much of this bottle of water costs right here? When you go in the store, you see the price tag, and you walk up to the counter, and you pay $1.99 or whatever it is. If you put the currency down that's accepted, and in the amount that is required, they'll give you the thing. And that's the way it is when you come into heaven. The Bible, the Bible, in the spiritual realm, the Bible said that it was, it was imputed, righteousness was imputed to Abraham because of his faith. What does that mean? Righteousness that he didn't have and could not generate was given to him because he gave God his faith. God said, you give me your faith, I'll give you righteousness. And it's the same way today. Anything that you see, desire, need, especially in your life, I believe God for it. You ask God for it, and then you, he, he, everyone that asks receives. Everyone that knocks, the door is open. Well, that, that right there means that he that keeps knocking. He that keeps asking. So if you just ask one or two times and give up, well, you know, my kids are around our house, and I know God's not like this. I don't know why God wants us to keep asking, but he has his reasons. Sometimes these kids around the house, their mother, I don't know what it is about their mother, can tone them out. So she can ignore them. And she just says, you know, so many of them, so many, so for so long, you know, after 40 kids, I mean. Speaking that by faith, though. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, you know what? Um, she, her nerves have found a way to deal with it. So it just zones out. And we'll be sitting in the car or at the house, in, in the living room, not even way in the back room. And, that, and Adam will say, Mom, 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 Mom. And sometimes, sometimes it's so bad, Jane, you get on board, Mama. <laughs> we got two of them back here tag teaming it, Mama, Mom, Mom. And there have been several times that she never, I had to say, baby, please answer them. <laughs> oh, what is it? <laughs> what do you want? <laughs> Man, that repeated over and over again. That gets to me. I hear them. I hear it the first time. I hear them when they say it. Now, if they say, daddy, out of my head. <laughs> I might tone that out. I don't know, but um, God don't tone you out. Amen. But sometimes you just need to keep asking him because your faith says, I believe God's going to do this. Hallelujah. That's why God will answer you. Hallelujah. He will answer you. One way or another, he will answer you. What did she say? I called to the Lord. He what? He heard me, and he what? Delivered me out of all my fears. Hey, God will answer you. God hears you. First John says this is a confidence that we have in him, that we know that if we ask anything according to his will, we know he hears us. And if we know he hears us, then we know we have the petition that we desire of him. By very definition, a petition is something that's put before their, somebody and kept before them. It's a petition for an appointed time to come. When the time comes, the answer will be given. God may not seem like he's listening, 
but he is listening. Amen. You can get into such a habit, and I'm not going to belabor this tonight because I don't really feel like I need to, but you can get into such a habit of complaining that you don't even look at it as something bad. It just seems for some people a favorite pastime. <laughs> Get together with friends and say, let me tell you about what happened to me. Girl. Hey, man, listen, this is what happened the other day. And they'll say, well, let me tell you something. And they got a little bit worse situation they're going to tell you. but They're going to one-up you. You get two complainers in the same room and the whole world is on fire and hell is everywhere and everything's <laughs> downed and it's all bad. But if you get one grain of faith, Woo! one grain of faith, like the grain of a seed of a mustard, that's such yeah. a tiny little seed. But I am telling you right now, I don't need no pity party. I don't need a pity party. I believe God is going to work. When, God, when we complain, the Bible says he gets angry. Numbers 14, God says, How long will I bear with this evil congregation? I have heard the complaints that are making, they are making against me. And then the first Corinthians that I read to you that said, They happened for an example For us that we would not complain as some of them also complained and were destroyed by the destroyer. See, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. When you open up your mouth and you complain, it means there's unbelief, fear, worry. I said this before and I'll say it again. You cannot worry and have faith in the same moment, in the same situation. You either worrying about it or you believing God's going to do something about it. You can't do both at the same time. Worry don't help anything and it don't bring any results, but faith does. Is it a battle? Yes. Is it hard sometimes? Yes, because the enemy sees how powerful faith is. And Philippians 2, 14 through 16 says this, Do all things without murmuring and disputing, that you may be blameless and harmless, the sons of God without rebuke in the midst of a crooked and perverse nation, among whom you shine as lights in the world. Why? Because we've got the right attitude. We've got the right spirit. And God's favor is shining on us and lighting us up and it's shining into this world. And then it says, holding forth the word of life. That's another reason. That I may rejoice in the day of Christ, that I have not run in vain, neither labored in vain. As I close, I will say this. This is why complaining is so dangerous because it cuts off your vision for the future. Jesus did not complain when he was on the cross, but the Bible said that because he, he endured the cross and kept dealt with the shame for the joy that was set before him, he endured it and despised the shame. Listen, if we as a church... Or if any time as an individual you're going through a wilderness, if you keep your eyes on the promised land, it's a whole lot easier not to complain and not to murmur when you know, I'm not going to stay here. This is not, I'm just here, you know, this is, I, I, I'm camping. This is a camp spot. This is not my permanent residence. I'm not going to raise up the antenna. I'm not going to put out the, you know, uh, stakes. This is, I'm not, I didn't come here to stay. I came to camp. This is just a moment. This is just a place that I'm in. <clears throat> 
But Satan tells us there's no way out, you know. And it feels like it by the way circumstances around us. And he'll say, you're going to die in the wilderness, you know. You're going to die in the wilderness. You know, murmuring and complaining is actually an accusation against God that his plan for you is not a good plan. <laughs> it, have you ever been underwater? Have you been underwater? Yeah. What happens if you open your mouth underwater? <laughs> Janie's been trying to learn how to swim. And she's, she's finding out that that don't work good when you open your mouth underwater. It comes in, don't it? Well, if you are in the middle of a moment when your faith is being tested and you open up your mouth and you start murmuring and complaining, that's what comes in and that's what begins to take root in your life because The Israelites said, we are going to die in the wilderness. You brought us into this wilderness to die. That was not God's promise. God had promised to get them to the promised land. But over and over they said it. You brought us out here to die in the wilderness. You know what the Lord finally said to them in Numbers 14, 27 through 29? I have heard the complaints that they are making. Say to them, just as you have spoken, so I will surely do to you. Your corpses shall fall in this wilderness. God said, you spoke it. You said it. You won't believe me. Don't let your promised land die Amen. just because you're in a wilderness. Don't get in doubt. Don't get in bitterness. Don't get in anger. Don't get in misery. Don't get in fear. Don't get in stress. Stay in faith. Amen. I am here tonight to declare to you that I don't care what the devil says. Every chair in this church. You stay around here long enough, you're going to see that I'm telling you the truth. We might be being tested right now, but you keep the faith, brothers and sisters, because every chair in this place is going to be full. I promise you. You know what Cheryl told me tonight before the service started? She said, I was just walking around. And by the way, we come to pre-service prayer. If anybody wants to start joining us, I'm trying to make a little bit bigger push for that. I got a singing CD. I think it's pretty awesome. And if you want to come in, uh, early, a little early before the service. We don't have to be here any specific time. Just We usually get here around 30 minutes early, so just whenever you can come if you want to join us. Anyway, it's, uh, it's uplifting and it's encouraging. But anyway, she was walking around in here with us a little bit and praying as she came by, he, by me, and here's what she said. Now, this is going to sound silly to some of you, maybe. You doubters, you doubters are going to think this is silly. You folks that don't have any faith in here is going to think this is silly. Hopefully that's nobody in here. But she said, I heard the Holy Spirit out of the blue. She said, I didn't have it on my mind. I wasn't praying about it. It just all of a sudden spontaneously came to me. Buy more chairs. Buy more chairs. See, I told you it's going to sound silly because we got half a church full of more full of empty chairs. But I'm going to tell you right now, overnight, God can change the situation. Woo! And I stand to declare to you that Eagles Nest Fellowship is in revival and we're going to have revival. We are in victory and we're going to see victory. We're in faith and we're going to see miracles. We're going to see God show himself to be powerful in Wichita, Mays, Kansas. 
We're going to see the glory of the Lord lifted up to the height. And God's going to be glorified. He said, if you be, if I be lifted up, I will draw all men to me. I will draw all men to me. Woo, so start believing. Get ready. And resist any urge to murmur or complain. I'm not saying you're doing it. I'm not trying to preach this as an indictment against you. I just believe that God is trying to say, I am truly watching right now because you push through all the other obstacles, all the other battles, all the other trials, all the other waiting period. And now it's came down to a technicality. And I want to see if you'll keep your mouth right. You know, I have found, and I think you'll find this to be true, that sometimes the best thing to do when I'm going through a wilderness or a trial is just keep my mouth shut. <laughs> right? Sometimes the best thing I can do is just not say anything. Mmm, God is good. I was telling these kids the other day, driving down the road, I've been getting my mouth saved. I'm saved, but my mouth needs to be saved. <laughs> Have you ever been there? You know, you're saved, but is your mouth saved? <laughs> not, not cursing, but just speaking things sometimes. It's just describing a scenario or a situation, and that, I don't, that's doubt. That's murmuring. I'm not going to do it no more. And so, um, you know, my thing is to talk to people when I'm driving because nobody in this town knows how to drive but me. <laughs> <laughs> so I have to gripe at them. I have to complain, you know. And I call them all kind of things, everything but cussing. Reprobates and devils and... <laughs> 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 Woo, here about two years ago, the Lord convic convicted me of idiots and stupid and all that, so I had to stop that. So now it's just, you know, Bible stuff. <laughs> but I was opening, that's a hard, once you get into a habit of doing that, you know how hard that is to stop? Kids were sitting in the car one other day, I said, that guy, just look at that, you devil. And I said, oh, God, <laughs> forgive me. And I apologized to them in front of them, and I said, look, I've been doing this so long, <laughs> but I'm going to stop it. It's going to stop. Amen. I said, Lord, forgive me for that, and you're going to bless them. God bless them, people. Bless them yeah, in the on. name of Jesus. If anything, bless them so they know how to drive better. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's usually probably just me. I'm the one that just needs to relax and enjoy living for God. Amen. Because... Even in the trial, you will find the alternative is what she talked about. The alternative to complaining is praise. Amen. It's praise. Amen. There was this lady that I read a story here not long ago, a pastor's wife, that they took a trip to the Ukraine and... They went into this room in this area, and they, uh, she was trying to wash her hands, so she got her hands all soapy and tried to turn the water on. There was no water. The water wouldn't come out. So she said, I refuse to complain. So she said, what you learn in an adversity is a new praise. What does that mean? A new praise is something that you've been taking for granted, that you hadn't even been praising God for. So she said, next time when I came in and I turned the water on and the water came, she said, I praised God for the water coming. I praise God because that's a new praise. And sometimes we just need to be thankful and praise the Lord. You know, I got a car that the air conditioner fan on it, sometimes it blows and sometimes it don't. And today was one of the days that it didn't blow. And I had faith from the time I left to the time I got back. But God's going to fix that. 
He's going to fix that fan. It's going to start blowing. Um, but what I have found is for that to be true. Because right now, and in the July and August, when that fan starts blowing, I'm going to be praising God for it. Praise God. Thank you, Jesus. Let's stand. Bible says in everything give thanks. For this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. There is so much robbing ourselves and cutting our own blessings out. By things we say, things we do, that if we just will clean up our language, come out of the abundance of the heart, speak faith, whether you feel it, whether it's real or not, speak it. That's just like praise. Paul and Silas, do you realize they beat him with many stripes till he was bleeding? They did a lot of... <clears throat> Really hard things on him. His black back was bleeding. And then they laid him on a wooden pallet. Do you think at midnight after being beat like that and tortured that he literally felt like praising God? No, he did not feel like praising God. He had pain probably racking, racking through his body. But he chose to praise God. And that's the difference. When we make a choice to praise him because he's good. And he said he has, knows his plans about us, that they're good plans and not bad, to give us a, an expected end and to favor us and to bless us. That's what I'm praising him for. I'm praising him for the promised land. Might be going through the wilderness right now, but I'm going to keep praising God for the promised land because I choose to praise him. Because if he said it, I believe it. Amen. Amen. His word cannot lie. Can you raise your hands right now and just love the Lord right now?